What's going on, everyone? This is the Fraser LeVay Podcast. I am with an incredible host, the most unique host we've had on the podcast because Raj, who is from uh, 1023 Now Radio. 1023 Now Radio. There you go. In in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Edmonton, Canada. Of course. Go Oilers. Yeah, and uh, we have not spoken in like 24 years since we graduated high school. We didn't even, when we started this podcast, we didn't even say a word. I texted him before. I was like, "Hey, let's just jump into the podcast, and this is how we will reunite and come full circle." Just together. quickly, man. After not it's seeing nice you for seeing 24 you. years, I have to say, like, we I think we might be aging the best out of our grad class here. Yeah, this is amazing. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> uh, and, and it. And it wasn't because we don't like each other. It was just you moved away. I moved away. And so there was really never a chance for us to like bump into each other when we're back home or whatever. Yeah, life happens, man. Married, new house, and just here we are. Here I we are. I love that. It's great. And, uh, from small town Kamloops, now you're just, you're leading the world in, in that. What kind of radio station is it? Like what kind of stuff do you talk? Uh, it's a one or two, three now radio. It's about join the conversation. Remember how we used to be into like Seinfeld during drama class and all that? Yeah. It, it's stuff like that little moments throughout your day that you have conversations about. It's great. It's a fun gig. It's super awesome. But, uh, Hey, talking about sports isn't something I get to do on the radio. So I'm excited about this. Yeah, absolutely. And so everyone knows this is going to be the Canada soccer <laughs> podcast, as well as sprinkle in some Olympic men's basketball. Very exciting. And, uh, yeah, and I, I think, because I, I, as you probably remember, I like to make everything about myself. We started doing announcements in high school for the yearbook. Yeah. And uh, and I would like to say, like, I brought, I was doing the announcements. I was like, oh, Raj, come, you know, we got to do it for our drama class. And you were part of that. I don't know if that spurned you now being a radio host, but I'm going to take credit for it, or at least <laughs> a little bit of it. You know what? Just take all the credit. Why not? <laughs> it's fine. It's okay. It's great. Take yeah. it all. Take do you remember? All. Do you remember any of those? Like we did Seinfeld stuff, like no soup for you. Do you remember that one? I remember it vividly. And you know what? I don't even think the teachers knew anything about the soup Nazi or anything like that <laughs> yeah. either. It just went under the radar and we're okay with it. We we're good. <laughs> I, I still remember we came back to class because I got you would you would uh, pretend you're like <laughs> it was incredible. Yeah. I this is it. this is great though, man. Talking, yeah. I mean, we you, you were a goal scorer in high school. I played on the defensive side, mainly mainly on the sidelines. But <laughs> you were there, man. You were there. We would play pickup hockey as well, just like uh, street hockey. Yeah, this is nice. Uh, remember the game kickball, elementary, yeah. all the way through there here. But hey, still athletic, just a little less cartilage in the knees, and we're good. Yeah, no doubt. I've actually I'm getting a knee replacement surgery because of said cartilage uh, this summer. Oh my. Oh yeah. my, Fraser! Holy, dating, uh, dating, dating ourselves even more. You know, up here we're aging well. The rest of the body, yeah. not so much. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, um, let's get into it then. And uh, Canada soccer, incredible. I mean, we're great performance today. Mm-hmm. Today, I woke up. I don't know about you, but I woke up a little less frustrated um, with the game last night. I mean, mm-hmm. going into Argentina, they had a puncher's chance and. They didn't play their best. That that mm-hmm. wasn't Canada's best game by any means. No. They they had some chances, but overall, taking out Argentina in a semifinal in the Copa America was a pretty tall task to do. And I think, for the most part, the showing they did well. Mm-hmm. They did pretty well for for a new program that's developing, still quite young. Getting to the semifinals of the Copa America was a huge, huge accomplishment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just talent wise, they're they're bringing on. I think like the seventy eighth minute, they brought on the top, the leading goal scorer in Syria as like yeah. their garbage time sub, <laughs> where we don't have anything like that. Well, Martinez is a top goal scorer in the Copa America, and he didn't even start. Yeah, they brought on Alvarez, who scored his second goal against Canada. Right, mm-hmm. so that just shows you the depth that Argentina has, and. When you read the stats after the game that Argentina has only lost two games in their last, what, 62 or 65 games or something like that. So they've won mm-hmm. more trophies and they've had losses in that time. Yeah. It was, it was a pretty big, tall task for Canada to try and accomplish that. So I think they can be pretty proud with their performance. And isn't it great being frustrated this morning that they probably could have had a goal, right? Mm-hmm. If, if, if they had some finish. And I think that's been the most troubling thing throughout the tournament for Canada 
is their lack of quality in the final in the final few touches when they probably mm-hmm. could have scored that extra goal or two, right? To make it a bit more interesting. Yeah, and I think that shows obviously the Argentinas in the world, the Brazils of the world, they've had a, a football at their foot since they're out the womb kind of thing. So they have those final perfect touches where we over dribble, we take two touches instead of one, you know, just a, a few things, which I mean, it's not the end of the world. We're not a soccer powerhouse. So I think it's, it's great to see what we're doing. Not yet. And I'll say this about the Canadian program with Jesse Marsh. I had a few questions about when he was hired, about what we were going to get. Mm -hmm. But if this is Jesse Marsh's Soccer Canada after six or seven weeks with the program, getting us to the semifinal, Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to what's potentially going to happen a year down the road when we're playing in the Gold Cup again. And two years after that, when we're hosting the World Cup, that's going to be pretty significant if it goes this way. And now it allows him more time to find... uh, potential depth in Canadian players, right? To, to seek out players that are playing in Europe that potentially could qualify playing for Canada. So mm-hmm. I'm really excited about the prospect of where this program is going and what they could be doing. And the great thing for him taking over right now is how many young stars are, aren't even at their full potential just yet. Mm-hmm. And he gets to develop that, right? Like we, we can talk about Alfonso Davies, you know, playing for Bayern Munich. Potentially on a move to Real Madrid, right? Like yeah. that, that would be absolutely massive. You have Jonathan David playing in France, and apparently rumors now that um, Bombido and Chelsea. Cornelius oh, yeah. could, could potentially be making a move to France as well. And Jonathan David, yes, moving to the English Premier League. And uh, Ismail Kone just uh, made a transfer to Marseille. So the growth of the core is really important right now. And I think outside of that, uh, Canada really needs to try and develop and work on getting that extra depth of talent. So, you know, when we have an opportunity to try and bring on an Alvarez as a substitute, you know, that, yeah. that would be, that would be the <laughs> dream. Then that's two or three years down the road, but yeah. it's great seeing these strides coming through. Absolutely. Yeah. Just the talent. And I think uh, just being, you know, nice to our team. I living in the U S once they got knocked out, it was just hell and brim fire. This, that uh, it's, I don't want to be pessimistic, but Canada is never going to be France in soccer. Canada is never going to be Brazil. Canada is never going to be Argentina. Just from a, it's not something we live and breathe. It's our Canada's third sport, fourth sport is the USA's fifth sport. Yeah. You're just never where there. They live and breathe soccer everywhere. It's the only thing you do. Obviously they have other sports, but it's just knowing that we're never going to be always top three in the world, but we'll be, 10th 15th and there's a chance we can kind of blossom up and you know be an underdog be the iceland be the moroccos of the world and i'm okay with the underdog story because who doesn't Mm. love a good underdog look at the euros right now georgia making it through romania making it through right uh slovakia and slovenia there right so i i think this is the year of underdog in sports and canada was right there with them too and you know that that win against venezuela was huge i i will say this though about the talent development we may never be a top 10 consistently or mm. top five somewhere around there right but i think what I, I i really have a whole lot of promise for is the development of the canadian premier league here in yeah. uh, Ca- canada the gap between, you know, in your days playing in university, there wasn't anywhere to go afterwards. Mm-hmm. Still a bunch of talented kids just need a bit more time to, to go. And now you have the Canadian Premier League that closes a gap a little bit, develops more, where players can go off and play in the MLS, where we've had a few players now in the Canadian Premier League who have gone off to play second division in Europe somewhere. So acquiring that talent is a major major step and it's going to take time and i think the the key th- takeaway for me after the game was stefan astacchio when they were talking about him and he said you know we need that depth we need mm-hmm. that depth going forward and i this is this is a step one now in that's going to pay dividends in year five or year six afterwards so yeah i'm really looking forward to to that development because now people have places to go yeah, you nailed it. I mean, just the basketball and soccer, where it's come from when I left high school to where it is now is just so beautiful to see kids from Kamloops gain unreal opportunities that never was an option back when I was playing. Just, yeah, like you said, 15, 20 years ago, this there was nothing. You'd kind of play for your local semi-pro-ish league after college and 
that was really it. So it's beautiful yeah. to see everything that's going. And this kind of development here is going to be a great thing. And hopefully there's um, a, a women's league equivalent to grow the Canadian women's program more too. And uh, but as far as uh, the men's team right now, they're they're doing a lot of great things. But you can start to see in the game last night where you have Alfonso Davies, you have Jonathan David, and what it's like for them playing against this talent versus mm-hmm. everybody else right now. Yeah, And there is a gap in that Canadian roster right now. That gap can close, but we need more of that development and more of these players potentially going to Europe. And uh, an exciting player for Canada right now, too, I wanted to put some spotlight on was uh, Jacob Schaffelberg, the Nova mm-hmm. Scotia kid. That I think he might be one of the young stars out of this tournament. Yeah, And I, I think that kid probably might be playing in Europe in a couple of years or so because he might outgrow the MLS real soon. He, he put himself on the map here to, uh, with this tournament. It was still a game to go, too. Yeah. Yeah, he's uh, the fastest white man alive, I think. He's I think absolutely- so. <laughs> and he's, he, he's, it's beautiful watching him run because he's got that hockey mullet too. But I heard in an interview, he's never played yeah. hockey before. He can't skate. Oh. So <laughs> this, wow. Yeah, I know. Kid from Nova Scotia, from the hometown of Sidney Crosby. But he, he said he can't skate or he can't stop. So I guess running is better for him. That's, I would love to see what his uh, birth process was. Like, <laughs> no, I'm not playing hockey. I'm playing soccer. Dad was yeah. like, uh, dad must be some big soccer nut or I, I wonder. I have no idea, but the fact a kid from Nova Scotia can get to play against the greatest of all time, Lionel Messi, you know, and yeah. that's he's the the great stat that I saw last night was he's second in the Copa America and created uh, and created chances for mm-hmm. only behind Lionel Messi. Wow, and that's a phenomenal stat for any Canadian player. I know we're getting into the metrics and stuff there, but no. these get these into are the, the stats. Yeah, these are the things here that we 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 should be trying to grow more of and trying to find the next Jacob Schaffelberg, trying to find the next Alfonso Davies and and going from there. And I think the Canadian program is on its way to do that. The other important thing I want to say is this, is not a lot of people are talking about, but just with getting to the semifinal uh, with Canada, they made $8 million for the Canadian soccer program. Wow. And considering how poorly funded, I mean, I've seen, not seen, I personally don't know any drug dealers, but I believe some drug <laughs> dealers have better books than the Canadian Soccer Association, right? Yeah. So this $8 million is a nice, unexpected injection of money from advancing from the group stage. So hopefully, you know, put in the right hands, it can make this go a long, long way. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point as well. And I think a big takeaway there is you're saying basically Schaffelberg is the next Messi. Canadian Messi, I think. will Canadian Messi, why not? Let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, perfect. yeah, it's it, it's exciting, though. It really is exciting because this is, this is the stuff that we, I mean, this is the stuff that we dreamed of, right? Like, we, mm-hmm. we never had a Canadian team like this growing up in our high school days, right? We, yeah. we had hoped, we had prayed, and, you know, when – the end of the day we're we're pretending we're roberto baggio back in the day bending it into the top corner at you know our old high school we yeah. weren't talking about any canadian players and what's exciting now is i have young nieces and nephews who are pretending they're these canadian players right so development the growth of the game across the border here and it, it's it's really growing and it's piquing a lot of interest so i i, I really feel like come 2026 Canada, they've set the bar high now with the Copa America, and now it's time to exceed that. And I feel like they can really, really do this. Yeah, and another great point. I don't think there, us growing up, there was one jersey we would buy as kids. Not like we could have afforded it anyways, but like, was there a player that Nash was a little bit later, like five years later when he really blossomed? Like in high school and growing up, there was no one. No, and I, I think around that time, we... There was Craig Forrest, who was a goalkeeper. He was playing in Europe yeah. at that time, but I don't even think you could go to a hand sport or a local soccer shop and find anything that had a Canadian jersey or a Canadian logo on it, right? So yeah. we weren't even sure that there was fully a program that existed. So it, it it's nice to see that now, especially here in Edmonton, they, they had a few watch parties and it was great seeing the bars packed with yeah. Canadian fans. and. Uh, the interesting thing was, is when you scroll through Twitter or X or whatever it's called now is there was people who were putting out there their messages saying, I'm not a soccer fan, but, and it was followed by a message. I'm giving this a shot. I'm not a soccer fan, but right. And it's, yeah. it's really nice to see that kind of encouragement that there are people out there who are willing to give this a shot. And 
the success of the program means more will follow. And I think Canada's on their way there. They're doing everything right right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, our generation, we're kind of the, the beginning of soccer moms, soccer dads, and now we're the kids who are becoming much smarter. Like our parents didn't know anything about soccer. They were soccer moms and soccer dads, but they knew how to bring oranges, at least my parents. Yeah. Orange slices and a little bit of Indian food for me to keep those calories <laughs> going. Yeah. And, and away we go from there. And but you, it was kick and run soccer. It wasn't, you know, nice Play passing. that long ball. Yeah. Get it high it, and get it out. Play it to your fastest player. <laughs> that was basically all we had. Yeah. Shortest so, player getting that. And, and now there's there's so much more connectivity between the players and the program because of the success of certain players, right? And mm-hmm. I, I know we're going to be talking about basketball later, but I, I wanted to throw this comparison out there too. And what Vince Carter did for the Toronto Raptors when he first came in to grow the game and, you know, it, with not intent, he just – was a really good basketball player and Tracy McGrady included in that too. It just exploded at that point, right? There was all these youth programs. And I feel like this, our golden generation with Davies, David, and so on, they're going to create the same effect. And we'll see this, you know, five, 10 years down the line uh, of this boom. And I really feel like there is going to be a boom in soccer academies, the growth of the sport and everything from down to the house level to the semi-pro level, I feel like the Canadian Premier League is going to expand at some point too. So uh, this generation may not enjoy all the success where Canada, you know, is going to be competing in future semifinals. But I think the next generation might be the ones to be able to carry that through in that pipeline. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, even to build on that, I'm excited that while I'm not positive we're ever going to be in a top 10 in the world, I know we're going to be a top team in North America and in CONCACAF. Like the fact that I have full confidence we can beat the USA, we can beat Mexico was something I never thought I would have. I think we are better, you know, give us 10 games against any, we'll win six, we'll win more. So it's nice that we're really the kings of CONCACAF, or at least you can argue we are and will be the kings of CONCACAF kind of thing. No, so. you even saying that just gave me like goosebumps right now, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's nice hearing that, that we're not – just a team at the table anymore where actually mm-hmm. other teams are going to come up with a game plan. They, they might fear coming to Canada to play us in a home game. Right. And mm-hmm. we went to Azteca and I believe we drew there during the world cup. And I went I there. Was, I was there. You were there at that game. I was at that game. Yeah. What an environment. Right. And oh we, my God. We, we pulled away with, with a draw out of that. Right. Yeah. And that, that was spectacular. And I was fortunate enough to see the rubber match here at oh, Commonwealth wow. Stadium in November, and to see Commonwealth Stadium sold out uh, to, to support these guys, and Canada won that game 2-1 on the way to qualifying, there was something percolating in the air there where people thought, okay, mm. you know, we're they're playing at minus 12, and it was packed mm. out there, right? So That was the it, famed Ice Tecca game, wasn't it? The the Ice Tecca game and Sam Atacubi jumping into the snowbank, and his should be on a Cana- yeah, yeah, part of our heritage moment right there, right? So uh-huh. it's 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 a lot of good things happening there. But as far as being the kings of CONCACAF, it starts with the Gold Cup. Win that Gold Cup. Take out mm. USA. And it's it's great for me seeing Alexei Lawless and Carly Lloyd just trash talk the Canadian program, you know, not mm-hmm. wanting to get see them get out of the group, not wanting them yeah. to beat Venezuela. And then playing Argentina, I'm sure they had a little bit of a smile on their face, but at the same time, the U.S. were three and out, and that was supposed to be Canada. And same thing with Mexico, mm-hmm. too. So I really feel like Canada will be the kings of the north here when it comes to the CONCACAF region. And, you know, it's it, it's exciting. It, it's very nice. to even, even saying it out loud, it doesn't feel real. This isn't yeah. a video game we're talking about here. This <laughs> is real life, you know? So. Uh. I I think when it comes to this region, we got a new contender and it's Canada and it's sure nice to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we used to live in the land of the Costa Rica's, the Jamaica's, the Panama's, and now I have no, no worries that we're not going to beat them nine times out of 10. I'm sure we will lose to here and there to a Panama, to a Nicaragua or whatever, but knowing that we're the big dog is such an incredible feeling. And, uh, and I think just as equal to or better than the USA, which obviously being the USA's younger brother, smaller brother, where we don't get to come out on top on them on miscellaneous sports that often. So it's great, great for yeah. uh, the country. It, it, it's nice. It's nice being able to pull some of that pie away and get us getting a bigger share of it too. So 
Um, you know, it would have been nice to see more Canadian fans at the Copa America, but from what I mm. hear, ticket delegation was absolutely atrocious for the Canadian fans, but we travel well and we support mm. well. And it's, it's nice seeing these little subtle intricacies in the game that are growing with the fan base and others taking interest in it too. And again, the success of the program, the success, uh, success of the team right now is paying off huge in this country. Hockey will always be number one. CFL might even be a little bit ahead at some point, right? But mm -hmm. I, Canada's really growing this game pretty well right now, and it's thanks to what this program is putting together for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, just talking overall, we talked over some players who stood out, which Shackleberg, obviously incredible. I think we have the fastest three players, maybe even four, in CONCACAF, if not the world, which is exciting. Yeah. Um, we're just an exciting team to watch. We're not boring. You know, even if we are losing to Argentina, at least it, the first half was fun. The second half was kind of shit. But the there was a player that I really missed yesterday, and I thought he could have been a difference maker. Unfortunately, he picked up an injury during uh, training, and that was uh, Tejon Buchanan. Yeah. And when you talk about speed, that guy's a road runner. He's mm -hmm. you know having him, Schaffelberg, Davies, like that. That's a lot of speed to burn right there too. And it was unfortunate that he got injured in training because he is somebody, he's playing for Inter Milan right now. And yeah. I don't know if that's the right fit for the team, for the style of play. Uh, you know, he may have to find a new home at some point too, but he's he's a phenomenal player. And I just don't think we've seen the best out of him yet in the Canadian program. He's had flashes. And I think there's going to be a time in 2026 where he's a player in the World Cup that everybody's talking about for Canada. Players to watch going into that tournament. Obviously, Ismail Kone played really uh, spectacularly. There's a few other players, though, that have yet to decide where they're going to be playing and who they're going to represent. Now, one name I want to throw at you because in a few years, if this comes back, I'm taking all the credit for this one, okay? Right, yeah. his, his name is Promise David. He just made a move to Belgium. He's going to be playing in the top uh, league there. He has ties to Canada, but he also has ties to Nigeria. I'm hoping he gets lured to the Canadian program. He's a six foot five center forward, and he's a real game breaker. I feel like under the right team, the right coaching, and it's hopefully with Canada, knock on wood, but mm -hmm. I hope he comes because this kid will be a strength of attack and a huge, huge target. So I'm hoping in the future, 2026, even at the Gold Cup, that we see him in a Canadian uniform. But keep an eye out. The name's Promise David. He's playing in Belgium, and I think he'll be playing in one of the top five leagues in Europe in the next couple of years, too. Nice. I love that. Great. Good insight. People are getting excited. Yeah. it's it's. I feel like a scout. The Canadian program can't afford to hire <laughs> me, though. They got no money. <laughs> yeah. Team Canada, hire Raj. We need him. That's, That'd that's be the awesome. dream. Yeah. That'd be the dream. But it's... there. There's a... Again, we touched on it before, but there's a lot of youth on this team right now, right in mm -hmm. that age range of like 22 to 26. And this is why I have, you know, that tremendous optimism that going into 2026 of what we'll be able to do. And um, it might be tough to predict right now for that Gold Cup, but I really feel like Canada's playing in that final as well, too. Yeah. And, uh, and I think I love the thing about Davies and great players that people don't understand. Like I've been around, I'm not calling him Tom Brady, but I've been around Tom Brady and he has like an aura and Tom Brady created Wes Welker. He created Julian Edelman. He created all these players that would, would Gronkowski be Gronkowski without Brady. So Davies of course is not, but I'm just using his example where the great players can really rub off on everyone else. So Canada's never had a professional like him who plays at Bayern is going to Real who, whether it's dressing room habits, food habits, how he talks, how he handles himself, how he practices, that comes on down to everyone else. So it's nice we have someone that everyone can strive to be, can learn from versus just a, a similar player. Like, oh, I, I play with him in MLS. I don't give a shit what he does. You yeah. know, does that make sense? No, it, you need that player that comes in commanding and setting the bar. And mm -hmm. there isn't a player who's got more trophies to their name in that locker room than Alfonso Davies. And he's played along some really great players in Bayern Munich, right? And mm -hmm. he's played in those Champion League games against Real Madrid. He even scored against them. So yeah. um, him coming in, and my favorite story about Alfonso Davies will go back to John Herdman, the previous coach. And this is when they were still in the World Cup qualifying is they had, I think, two or three games going into Central America that were critical points. And the coaching staff were 
mapping it out at that point of, you know, we can win this game. We might get a draw here. We can try and get a draw here, but just come away with points. And he went up to that chalkboard apparently. And this is what uh, the reporter said is he crossed that all out. And he says, we're winning every game. (laughs) And, and just to say something so bold in front of the entire locker room at that point, I think it just switches from, we're not just here to keep a warm seat. We're actually going to go through this. And, and I believe Canada on that trip ended up taking two out of the three games there, mm-hmm. uh, which is phenomenal because winning soccer games in Central America is, is a pretty tough ask. And they went on the road and they've, uh, they've done that, right? So yeah. I think right now, as far as leadership and him being a captain, he's a great choice. And I think around him with Kyle Lahren, Jonathan David, relying on their experience to Stefan Estacchio playing for Porto, they have a really good core of leadership. And this is why I believe so much in this group and what they're doing and what they're going to be able to accomplish. As long as Jesse Marsh keeps this program going, um, there's, there's a lot to look forward to. So the other thing is here, you were just talking about Davies as I had a few people ask me, where do you think his best position is? Is Yes. I'm glad we're talking about that. Is it at left back? And in the Argentina game, I think part of it was around, maybe you might feel the same way too, but I felt like the fatigue and the lack of depth caught up with the team in the semifinals. They were okay for the first 20 minutes or so, 20, 25 minutes, mm-hmm. and then they kind of fell flat after that. Seeing Davies not engaged into the offense is is tough. You need him up there, but mm-hmm. he just couldn't make those runs. Now, I'm wondering if that's going to be the position that Jesse Marsh settles at, and we saw him play like a 4-2-2-2 system, And when they defended, they were more of a 4-3-3. I'm curious to see if Davies eventually is going to move up to that midfield. And Mm -hmm. if Marsh is actually going to play like a 4-3-3 press. Right now, they have the back line playing a high line. And they did get caught. There's some errors that happened with that. Argentina's first goal was a great play by uh, Alvarez to sneak in behind the line. And that's the cost. That's the high risk, high reward of playing that. But I really feel like... At some point, we'll see him more up in the offense. At least I would like to see that. I would like yeah. to see them play more of a 4 3 3 attack. And I feel as though Canada showed a little too much respect to Argentina yesterday when mm-hmm. it came to that final third. And when you hesitate against a team like Argentina, they'll capitalize and counter really, really quickly. And I think that's a big lesson that they're going to learn. But the aggression in showing offense is something that I'm really enjoying more so with Jesse Marsh compared to John Herdman. Mm -hmm. This is why I think Jesse Marsh is going to do a whole lot of good for this program. I think the key is though finding the right spot for Alfonso Davies. And it might be left back. We Mm -hmm. might might both be wrong here. Horribly wrong. But I, I feel like Alfonso Davies attacking with the ball with his speed causes a whole lot of chaos for anybody who's facing him or whether it's club or whether it's country. Yeah, and I do... Here's the thing. It's tough because we don't have depth. So it's like, well, we need defense because, you know, the better teams are going to be coming at us. And it's Davies is best position. But we just don't have the talent to have a talent such as him wasted as a left back where Kone had an, a fine tournament. I, he's still so young. I don't like Kone against right now against the best team. He dribbles so much. He over dribbles. He takes eight touches versus one where Davies in the center mid, or even I guess a left wing, if you wanted where Kone plays center mid, but he just can calm everyone down and do the right play more often. So even if you're saying a left mid or a a center mid, if he's only an eight out of 10 at a center mid, but he's a 10 out of 10 left back, I think it's still more valuable that we put an eight out of 10 at left back, whoever that is X player but we have him in the mid just making the right decisions, calming the ball down. That speed, like once he gets dribbling at you, is scary as hell. He can defend. He can track back kind of thing. I noticed a lot he was playing everywhere. He was playing left back and he was playing left mid at the same time, Yeah, which you can't keep up. And against the Netherlands, their goals came down his side because he was up the field, which is not his fault. He has to do that. He has to carry us in that method, but... I'd rather him be at a position as a center defensive mid or a center mid just box to box. And then he's got four or five people behind him. When he's up the field as a left back, he's only got three people and he's got a third of the field that he normally covers is wide open for a team to kind of get in there and 
and take advantage. So, well, watching him play in Bayern Munich, it's he has that support around him, right, to make that's, those runs. Right, they play a different yeah. system there, and. The, the one change in the midfield that I would like to see is you're talking about Ismail Kone there and how many touches it takes. I would really like to see a defensive midfielder come in and just clean it up behind him so he doesn't have to, right? He doesn't mm-hmm. have to make those extra few touches where he could just transport the ball, turn and touch and go. And the thing is, his speed is very deceptive. I, I didn't realize how quick and fast he was with the ball um, mm-hmm. last night, which is a great option. But you don't want that to be your go-to all the time. And yeah, I, I, the reason why I'm suggesting a four-three-three going forward with potentially, um, you know, Jonathan Azario hanging back there is he's potentially capable of doing that. But opening up Kone to play a more offensive role, Stefan Estakio mm. playing a more offensive role, and somebody be able to hold that defensive position where if a counterattack does happen, they're there, having that security blanket might also benefit. Davies on that left side moving forward, having that kind of coverage, right? But yeah. there's a player who plays for, I believe it's for the Vancouver Whitecaps. He's been injured. Sam Atakubi. Uh, mm-hmm. He's he's quite good. But him getting to the next level, he played in Turkey for a little while. He's playing in the MLS now. I feel like at that left back position, he can be a good player when you're talking about that seven or uh, seven out of 10 or eight out of 10. Yeah, Whether he's able to take that next step and become that opens up many more options for the Canadian program and Jesse, uh, Jesse Marsh. So again, we're talking about the depth and hoping and praying that there's something there. But this is, this is going to be something for Jesse Marsh now to figure out. He's had six or seven weeks with this team. He's seen them. He's got them to a semifinal. Hopefully a third place finish between you know Canada versus Uruguay or Colombia, whoever wins that semifinal today. And mm-hmm. I really feel like this is going to be something going forward where Jesse Marsh is going to be able to get the best out of the Canadian teams uh, going forward with the, even the depth. Yeah, absolutely. Another, yeah. if you don't mind, another player Go that ahead. I just wanted to mention, Ali Ahmed. This kid came on as yeah. a substitute yesterday. Speed to burn, lots of skill. I think the kid might be, you know, 120 pounds soaking wet, holding a breath. <laughs> <laughs> I need to put on some weight, but the skills there. This is another uh, kid I know they have high hopes for in the Canadian program. Uh, one of the best passers in the entire MLS, and he's great at creating chances and stuff too. So mm-hmm. these are guys that are going to be relied upon heavy, uh, heavily, and the Jesse Marsh is going to be watching their growth you know, with a microscope to see how well these guys are doing. But as far as showing right now, I think they're doing pretty good, and we'll probably see some of these younger guys in that third or fourth place game, depending on who we play, yeah. uh, just to see what we have. And why not give them an opportunity to to see what they could do against another juggernaut in South America? No, absolutely. It's going to be exciting to see how we do. Uh, just like you said, uh, is there anything else that you, the state of Canada soccer, or anything else you like to see before we kind of move on to basketball? Uh, no, I, I just think if... if um, with this Canadian program, this is more than just hope now. This is actual belief. Mm-hmm. And this isn't, you know, this isn't a false sense of confidence. This is actual confidence that, hey, we can hang with the best and we yeah. can play with the best. And it's an exciting time to be a fan of sports in Canada, but it's also an exciting time if you're if you're new to the game and you want to give it a shot. This is an exciting team to get uh, get behind. There's going to be a lot of talent, and you want to be on that bandwagon before everybody else jumps on in 2026. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, hope Buchanan gets better. Hope uh, I'm glad it was like a, a snap versus a torn ACL because I think those are easier to get healthier quicker. Yeah. For um, he was my he's always been my favorite non Davies player for the last three four years. Uh, he's been incredible. Yeah, so. just a special shout out to a player by the name of Alistair Johnson too. He's played yeah. every single minute in this tournament on that back line for Canada. He's an engine. I don't know how he does it. I don't know hmm. how he gets so much air into his body, but the guy's incredible. He plays for Celtic out in uh, Europe right now too, and they love <laughs> him there. He's a fan favorite. So Yeah, again, they won the double. I, I have friends who are <laughs> Scottish, and they hit me up. They're like, I love him. He's a great who are Celtic fans. You know, he plays just like they should in Scotland, real hard and aggressive and he's got those well. crazy eyes man the, the, yeah. the, the crazy canadian <laughs> eyes i love yeah. it i absolutely love it yeah uh, and then um 
What do you th- before I, I just came to me? Uh, Kamal Miller. What do you think about him not playing? Is that injury based or because he was an MLS All Star two years ago and so, he 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 played with Messi too in Miami. Yeah, as played well, with Messi. Yeah. I I think what Marsh was trying to do was inject more youth into the program. Hmm. And that's why he went with the pairing of Bombito and Cornelius on that. But there's nothing against Kamal Miller. I think he had a pretty good run playing with Steven Vittoria in the World Cup. Mm -hmm. Overall, the speed of Cornelius and Bombito and their pairing, like they're... They work together pretty well. And I'm excited to see where this duo is going to go going forward. Yeah. Uh, but I think this is more of a youth movement right now. Not saying Kamal Miller is old or anything, but I think his role might be coming off the bench. We may see him start mm-hmm. um, in this third or fourth place game to, to round things out. But he's he, he's been a great player for Canada. I think he'll continue being a serviceable player for Canada. I think the future, though, is in those two players there, Bombito and Cornelius, on that back line. Yeah. No, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I, I definitely miss him. I I'm, have my issues with Bombito, but like you say, he's still young. Cornelius played outrageous all tournaments, so it's going to be walked exciting. Away, walked away with Messi's jersey last night. Good on him for <laughs> calling that quick. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. All right, well, building on the excitement of Canada sports is Canada basketball. And just its place in the last 10 years has been incredible since... You know, really, Wiggins, obviously, you can argue other people before that. We gnashed way back. But once Wiggins hit the scene, it seemed like people have just been coming out of the woodworks from the Shea Gilgis Alexanders, the Jamal Murrays, on and on and on. We are from Kamloops, British Columbia, everyone. Kelly Olnick. Yeah, there we go. I was waiting for yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, his dad, I was a grad assistant under his father at um thompson rivers university so that was cool i got to work under him for a year and uh to see his son grow into what he's become is amazing from a small town in the what now like you're saying with uh soccer and how you can do more the basketball program in kamloops alone is head and shoulders what it was you know when we were growing up it's uh i'm glad to see we're catching up with the world on how to develop um people how to develop talent and and kelly runs a basketball program in in kamloops here and i know that because a few of my cousins were in that program as well right so yeah just overall with him genuine kind human being i've I've never met him personally but he took the time to to sign autographs get photos with uh, my family and all that kind of stuff too so i'm really looking forward to canadian basketball during this olympics here i know we're in the group of death yeah. It's going to be tough. Our opening it, game against Greece, Giannis, like that's that's going to be rough. It's not even the group of death. It's the group of a massacre. It's the worst group I've seen in any <laughs> sports of all time. You're, you're clicking through the rest of it and just like, really? Like Canada? Yeah. Like we couldn't have got one of the other teams from the other group, minus USA, of course. But mm-hmm. it's a weird thing to say that I'm not really afraid. Yeah, absolutely. The expectation changed for me after they won bronze in the FIBA World Cup. Yeah. And not to say it wasn't unexpected because we have talent in in the NBA and not just talent, all stars. Mm -hmm. Guys who are really, really good at what they do. And it's nice to have a starting lineup. You mentioned Steve Nash. Steve Nash, I think the last time we saw, oh my gosh, this came to me. The last time we saw Canada in the Olympics was in 2000 when Steve Nash was uh, playing there. We finished seventh. That was, that was an awful time. But now, yeah. Now there's actual quality talent. Our starting five is from the NBA, right? So yeah, um, we're the I, second uh, best odds to win behind the United States. Goes the U.S. at like minus three eighty, and then I think we're plus seven hundred, something like that. Then Serbia and France right behind us at around ten to one. I I really believe like Canada has offense, and I really feel like with Jamal Murray, and I, I feel like he's going to lead the way. Hmm. But I really feel like if Canada's going to get through the group stage, everything's going to be on the defense there. Yeah. Everything's going to be on Dylan Brooks. And I know he's kind of that pest, but I, I like that. Oh, I like yeah. The, you need I it. Like the, I like the swagger Canada has. And, yeah, he talks a lot of trash, and sometimes he gets called out for it or gets thrown back in his face. But Canada needs that, and it's nice that we have that, and we can back it up. and. I know going back to that FIBA World Cup, that wasn't the U.S. team that's at this Olympics, right? Mm-hmm. And, but to take on Greece, to take on, you know, if we make it out of this group in the quarterfinals, I'm not really worried about 
any other team. Mm. I just want Canada to be Canada and go show them what we got. We got a whole lot of skill here. And it sucks not having Wiggins there. You know, yeah. we Zach Eady uh, opted out to work on his training, and it sucks not having a big man. Those those are two uh, potential stars. Well, Wiggins a star for sure. Yeah. But even with that, losing two guys, you look at the rest of the roster. We're still pretty stacked. We're yeah, still pretty good. On the perimeter defensively, I mean, Dort is one of the best defenders in the NBA. Uh, SGA is one of the best defenders randomly in the NBA. He uh, he can guard multiple positions. He's up in the top three in steals, I want to say. Uh, so he has a great defensive record. And then Dylan Brooks, again, one of the best defenders in the NBA. So in a game that's primarily shooting in the uh, the Olympics, I think we're great to defend shooters. So, And then offensively, SGA, the second best player in the league last year, arguably the best. It's, wow, we've got the fact we're not scared of Giannis. I mean, we Don't should Don't mind this, be. it's just allergies. You're good. <laughs> We, we should be scared of Giannis, of course, but I mean, the Greece team easily, not easily, they could beat us. Spain could beat us. And uh, who's the other one in the group? Uh, Australia. Australia. Australia could beat us. But on paper, we should dominate Australia. We should beat Spain and we should beat Greece. So that's the fact that we're saying this out loud is absolutely unreal. I think if Canada goes two and one in this group, we're through. Oh yeah, I, I I don't know how it works. It's the same record if it's going to be the point differential or anything like so, that. So they do uh, first and second, and then the best third place finishers, like the best two third place finishers, move on. So I mean, barring an absolute disaster, we would be moving on. I feel like Canada at this point, we're we're going to do some damage here, and it it would be so great for this program to walk away with a medal here at the Olympics. And you know, one name that I'm hopeful for, and I was hoping he would have a better run last season with the Raptors is RJ Barrett. Yeah. I, I really want him this to be a coming out party. I'm hoping this is a taste of things to come for the Raptors um, too. And, and he showcases himself really, really well here. But I, I don't think it's beyond saying that Canada could potentially walk away with the bronze. It, you know, it, it would be great playing U S in the gold medal game. And it, it's easy to say that the U S are going to be playing for gold, but that's a stack roster too. And I, I think yeah. Canada, depending on how groupings work out, we really have a shot at this. Yeah. I think really just luck is what we need on the, uh, who we meet in the semifinals. So I would love if somehow my, my wish and my dream is Serbia and USA are on the other side and then it's us in France, Germany, whoever else, because Serbia, I think, is going to be, I think they're way undervalued um, because in the FIBA Americas, they're the best team, even though they lost to Germany, they're the best team, hands down, watching them. And that was without the best player in the world. Uh, Europeans just play the game so much better. It is a European form of basketball. You know, they have smaller courts, smaller three point lines. The ball bounces different. The ball's smaller. The USA always shoots terribly even though they have the best shooters in the world, because it's a whole new game. So I think I'm really nervous of Serbia. France with Wemby and Gobert is going to be tough, but I, we're still better than them on paper. Uh, but yeah, USA, Serbia, stay away from them as long as we can. And I think we're looking golden. I I like the scheduling right now for Canada, because when you're looking at Greece, Australia, Spain, and that's, I believe, the order that we play them. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with Spain uh, playing Spain last. I, yeah. I'm glad it's not the first game up because you know you lose that one against them, but you win your first two. That's fine. But yeah. if you, it, I really feel like in, in this kind of sense, when it comes to offensively gifted, Canada is defensively gifted. Canada is. They have all the makings of putting on a few upsets here and advancing far in this tournament. But when it comes to when it comes to the officiating, that's a different style too from what yeah. the NBA is, right? There, there's not a familiarity really with, with with the whole lot of players and things get called different. And I, I'm i curious to see what happens because if Canada medals here, this is quickly going to be coming. You know, basketball is already a big sport. We got the Canadian Elite Basketball League here that's growing, which is a whole lot of fun to watch here. But, um, you know, we, we talked about two sports here that are usually – down the pipeline when it comes behind hockey, right? Yeah. And I feel like if, if Canada can really get a medal here, show well here, they're going to close that gap on hockey pretty quick. Yeah. And I, I think, honestly, if Canada doesn't medal, it's a disaster, which who, think, who would ever think we'd be saying that? 
I think we have a chance to win gold. Uh, obviously, at 10 games against the USA, the USA probably wins six or seven of those. But one game, we, it can easily go either way. Um, and the USA has their own problems. They're old, who they're going to play, the rosters, the lineups. It's just, uh, I think the USA isn't as head and shoulders as, above Serbia, above Canada, above France as they ever have been in their lifetime, let alone this year. It's going to be interesting. And I read this morning that Kawhi Leonard uh, opted off the team to... Yeah. And I'm not sure who they replaced him with and how much of a difference that's going to be, but um, USA is still USA. They're, yeah. they're older. They can still shoot. They got, like you said, the best shooters in the game. There's If they don't win a gold, it's a complete disaster for them. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a phenomenal team. It would be great to walk away and pry that gold away from their hands and make them, <laughs> make them lose twice to Canada in two major tournaments, but... Again, like you said, it'd be great if Serbia and USA were on one side of the bracket. They played over there and Canada mm-hmm. had, you know, an easier time in that semifinal. Yeah. And I mean, the Olympics too, it's especially if you love basketball, it's going to be, it's the greatest Olympics it'll ever be for men's basketball, at least up, up until now. After it's going to be great. But the France team is exciting to watch with Wemby. Canada is exciting to watch. USA, of course, Serbia. Then you've got Giannis with Greece. Germany is randomly really good. So where it used to be kind of a one horse race or maybe a two horse race when Argentina was good for a little blip. Now it's six, seven, eight horses that all could potentially win. Super exciting. This is probably the closest gap that the world has ever closed in on us. Yeah. Right. When, it, when yeah. it comes to that. So it'll probably be out of team events, probably the one sport that's probably watched the most uh, out mm-hmm. of all of it, because the amount of talent that is going to be there. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. And, it's great with how much talent there is there. I still feel like Canada is under the radar right now, and I think that's a perfect place to be, Yeah, and especially being in that group of death. But Canada gets out of that group, look out. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, absolutely. Exciting stuff, man. Exci- exciting to be a Canadian sports fan. We actually we have a, a Canada sports podcast. Think about that. We yeah. actually can talk for fun about it. Versus We're not talking about hockey for four hours here. I didn't <laughs> yeah. even talk about the heartbreak of the Oilers losing in seven here. You know, yeah. So this is okay. I'm still depressed about that. But you know what? Canada's showcase here in, in soccer has, has been a nice way to mend that heart. Looking forward to the basketball. Looking forward to the Canadian women's team defending their gold in soccer too, right? So. Yeah. It's nice to see them turn the leaf from Christine St. Clair, who was phenomenal for the program, but there are other rising, uh, rising young stars like uh, Grosso coming up here. So it's an exciting time, like you said, to be a sports fan in Canada. And, you know, we'll do another podcast again when the Oilers win the Cup. Absolutely. We'll have to do one uh, maybe mid- mid-Olympics, a little recap. I think you've yeah, been a great... Yeah, potentially. I'd love to do that, man. A great guest, Raj Dami. Share your radio station again, how they can listen to you. 1023 Now Radio. Greatly appreciated here in Edmonton, number one in Canada. Let's go. All right. Thanks so much, Raj, and uh, we'll catch up. I love seeing you. This is a great 24-year reunion. Cheers, buddy. Let's not do it. Yeah, let's not wait another 24 years. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Take care, man. Bye. (laughs)